So if I've been doing my job correctly, then this video will be uploaded onto YouTube on October 10th. 10-10. 10, 10. 10 out of 10, baby. Yeah, I'm recording this on the night of Saturday, October 5th, because I am going to Vegas. So, yeah, hopefully y'all have seen a vlog or two from there. But in this video, I wanted to go over to the Vancouver Canucks and talk about a trade that may or may not have been a pretty big dub for the opposite team. I can already hear the cries of blasphemy in the comments section from many of my Canucks viewers out there. But in this video, I wanted to ask the question as to whether or not the Canucks took a big L on the Elias Lindholm trade. Now, this is a topic that admittedly we have discussed at length multiple times throughout the year. Vancouver made a trade with Calgary to get Lindholm. They brought him on. He was a good player, and then he left in free agency, and Calgary is reaping the benefits of that trade still. Two prospects, a roster player, and some picks. The Calgary Flames are chillin'. And with some of the things that have been popping up on social media the past few days, it has sort of started up this narrative, I feel, that the Calgary Flames and the stuff that they got in the Lindholm trade was very, very valuable for them. And maybe even more so valuable than the Vancouver Canucks may have anticipated it would have been initially. Now, spoiler alert, long story short here, I do want to say that, in my opinion, if you wanted to give a verdict to it, I do think the Lindholm trade was mutually beneficial to both sides, and maybe even more beneficial to Calgary. Does that necessarily translate to a Canucks L on the trade? I don't know. You can let me know your thoughts. But... Going over to the trade history here and actually seeing what the trade was, let's go out there and look at this here. So Vancouver acquired Elias Lindholm from the Calgary Flames in exchange for Andre Kuzmenko, Hunter Brustevich, Yoni Yermo, a first, and a conditional fourth. The fourth would have turned into a third if the Vancouver Canucks reached the Western Conference Finals in 2024. They didn't, so the pick stayed in the fourth round. Now, let's just put aside the picks that were actually given here, because the Calgary Flames did take some guys with those draft picks that I do think are very noteworthy, guys that Flames fans are very excited about. Even in the fourth round, they took Luke Misa, whom I'm actually really surprised slipped all the way to round number four. But other than that, if you focus on two of the three players that were involved in this trade, you have yourselves, of course, Hunter Brustevich, and you have Andre Kuzmenko. Let's disregard Yoni Yermo for now, because him and his profile, it's not really the best. A lot of this conversation started up the other day, in my opinion, because of what James Johnson YYC went out there and said during the preseason. Watching Hunter Brustevich play hockey, and I just want to say thank you to Elias Lindholm and the Vancouver Canucks. Obviously, he's talking about Brustevich and his offensive capabilities, how he moves around in the offensive zone, what he does when he is on the point there, how he was able to score 92 points in 67 games this most previous season with the Kitchener Rangers. He was one of the best OHL point producers, period. And the Vancouver Canucks gave up on this guy, sending him over to Calgary in that trade. Furthermore, we had ourselves a clip going around of the Calgary Flames... I don't know what it's called. This is like their Flames TV bonfire. I think it's a special event where the players are on a stage and they're asking questions to each other and there are funny responses and everything. You had a really funny video of Andre Kuzmenko responding to the question of if he had a three-on-three -three ball hockey, street hockey tournament, who would he want as his teammates? He had a really funny answer. It's a two-minute long video clip. I highly recommend you go out there and watch this video. It's so funny. He talks about Nazem Kadri and Rasmus Anderson and Mackenzie Wieger and Jonathan Huberdeau. Kuzmenko is such a funny, lovable guy. And that totally is an aspect of his personality that Canucks fans appreciated when he was here in my hometown. The problem was, Andre Kuzmenko just wasn't great under Rick Tockett, and as a result, it was kind of a foregone conclusion that he was going to get traded, considering his point production dipped a significant amount from year one to year two in Vancouver. We bring this up continuously, but he did produce a lot more points playing in the Calgary Flame system, scoring 25 in 29 games played. A big increase from his Vancouver Canucks point production in 2023-2024. Now, whether or not that translates into Kuzmenko doing well this season and then signing a contract extension and staying in Calgary, that remains to be seen. But for now, Andre Kuzmenko is in a pretty great spot, all things considered. 
So just thinking about these two guys, Perstevich and Kuzmenko, not even thinking about the draft picks and Yoni Yermo, did the Vancouver Canucks take an L by sending these guys away? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that even though Elias Lindholm did end up pricing himself out of Vancouver, he did get a whole bunch of money with the Boston Bruins to be a first-line center over there, even though he turned his back on the idea of being a third-line center for Vancouver at $7 million a year, I do think that the Vancouver Canucks making that Kuzmenko trade was more beneficial for them than had they just kept Kuzmenko and Brustevich around. We had said this a few times already, but for Brustevich, it was kind of up in the air whether or not he actually would have been willing to stick around with the Vancouver Canucks and be a meaningful part of their team. He is a right-handed defenseman, so if you wanted to project numbers, okay, let's say Tom Villander has a pretty good development path. Let's say Philip Peronik sticks around for a while. Is Brustevich going to be in a position where he's happy being maybe a third-pairing defenseman with the Vancouver Canucks long-term? Because if he's good enough to overtake Kronik and Villander, then okay, awesome. But for a third-round guy who dominated the OHL with the amount of points that he had, there was already some uncertainty as to whether or not Vancouver would be an ultimate destination for him. Also, there were some questions about translatability, whether or not his offense would establish itself in the same way as it did in the OHL at higher levels of play. In the preseason, he looked alright, but maybe that's just the eye test. Let's go back over onto that James YYC tweet talking about Hunter Brustevich and how he's really good because E and W Canucks went out there and replied with the game score impact card of the game that James YYC is referring to. Calgary versus Winnipeg on October 2nd, 2024. You can see that Hunter Brustevich had one of the worst overall on ice projected numbers on the team. He had the absolute lowest defensive metric paired with an admittedly very high offensive metric. So the value kind of balances itself out here. Hunter Brustevich in this game that James YYC is referring to had a really strong offensive game, but he was terrible defensively, even worse than Jared Tenorti. So at the same time, while Hunter Brustevich is an offensively talented player, he still does have hoops and hurdles to jump over before he's going to be able to make himself known as an NHL guy. For the Vancouver Canucks, would they have had the time to wait for this kind of a player? Probably not. You think about the window Vancouver has right now, Miller, Besser, Pedersen, Hughes, Kronick, everybody else in the organization, they cannot wait for another player to take two or three years to develop whilst they're in this window. They gotta try and win themselves a Stanley Cup whilst Hughes is on the contract that he's on because he's only making 7.8 and that doesn't go on forever. Meanwhile, in Calgary, they're already in some sort of a retooling on the fly kind of thing. People are talking about whether or not Nas could get traded, whether or not Huberto could find himself out. It'd be impossible, almost, unless a team is really willing to bite the bullet and take a chance on those players. But the idea is there, thus indicating the Calgary Flames' desire for potentially getting younger and potentially getting more assets. We had seen this with their fire sale over the past year and a bit. Hannafin, Toffoli, Zadorov, Lindholm, Tanev everybody's gone. And Huberto and Nas are still there. So definitely you can understand that from the trying to get younger, team building perspective, the Calgary Flames ended up winning the Elias Lindholm trade by a pretty significant margin. But in terms of getting more competitive and allowing the team to exhibit what it is they need now, Vancouver definitely had an edge in that category too. So all in all, my conclusion remains the same. This was a win-win trade, although if you wanted to talk about what is literally on the team right now, hey, guess what? The Vancouver Canucks don't have Lindholm. The Flames have Brustevich, Kuzmenko, Yermo, and the two prospects they had taken with the draft pick. So they're doing okay, and they certainly are happy with that return. For Vancouver, though, a shot in the dark is what they got with Elias Lindholm in the playoffs, and a really good shot in the dark, was it? He scored some really important goals. He scored the first goal of the Nashville series. He had scored the overtime winner in Game 4 to give the Canucks a 3-1 series lead. He was awesome in Vancouver. And not to say that Andre Kuzmenko wouldn't have been. He just really wasn't a fit with the team ever since Rick Taka took over. So they kind of had to move him. And getting Lindholm in exchange is worth the price of the prospects that I think the Vancouver Canucks might not have seen too much value in anyway. Not to disrespect Yermo and Brustevich, they could still become NHL players, it's just, for Yermo, that path is going to be a lot longer, and Brustevich, I think, there's still a lot more to go through that I don't know if it would have been too valuable for Vancouver anyways. So, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as to whether or not Vancouver ended up losing this trade. I hope you enjoyed this video, Shadow Scrolls 99, and bye.